Thank you. Uh, we've heard a lot of exciting data um, on molecular biomarkers at this meeting, uh, their promise as well as some of the challenges in bringing them into the clinic. Uh, and I think this will be a major focus uh, in the years to come. So in the next 24 months, I think we will have revised and updated our guidelines for germline testing. We will have better defined indications for genomic testing of tumor tissue. Uh, and we will have identified new targets and biomarkers. And with advances in omic technologies, I think we'll be able to ask biomarker questions in different ways, uh, which I'll talk um, a little bit about these points. Uh, so we heard from Colin Pritchard that up to 12% of advanced prostate cancer patients have germline mutations in DNA repair genes unselected for age or family history, advocating for routine genetic testing. But what I heard yesterday is that the majority of people in the room are not testing for these alterations, and there are a number of reasons for this. Um, and what state should we be testing? All metastatic CRPC, NEM1, what about select, select high-risk localized disease? And we heard yesterday about this, and I think in the coming months to years, we will have better defined risk factors to help guide earlier testing race, ethnicity, family history, age, and other factors. We will better understand the prognostic value of these alterations, not just at initial diagnosis, but for each stage of the disease. We will have a better understanding of their predictive role. We heard about PARP as well as platinum, but how can these alterations predict response to other therapies that we have, or can they? And we're already starting to hear early data on this. Uh, these tests are not routinely available, um, but we're, I think this is already uh, changing as we move away from single gene testing towards panel testing, and costs are already coming down. And they will start to make their way into guidelines approvals uh, and, and reimbursement. We will have better indications for genomic testing. To date, there are no molecular assays approved for the clinical management of advanced prostate cancer patients. Metastatic biopsies are challenging, serial biopsies not feasible. Um, and might mainly have been limited to research studies, but I think already making their way into the clinic into some practices as commercially available assays become increasingly available. And we heard uh, during this meeting that there are a number, it's becoming increasingly relevant as there are a number of molecular alterations enriched in advanced disease that may predict response to therapies. And as we hear, get readouts of these trials very soon, we'll have a better understanding of how these alterations may predict uh, response to the therapies uh, that we have and the newer ones in development. So currently, we use several factors in making decisions. I see genomic testing as an additional tool that will aid in our decision making um, in our decision making and counseling as these costs are rapidly going to decrease uh, in the coming years. <coughs> Currently, we, we, perform, we consider metastatic biopsies for suspected small cell transformation, for eligibility in biomarker clinical trials, um, but as these drugs move their way to, towards approval, we'll have better guidelines of how to test for them, when to test for them, uh, and what to do with the results. Uh, in specialized centers, success rates for sclerotic bone biopsies have improved, uh, but these protocols are not widely disseminated, nor are the best tissue handling practices. And I think, uh, at least for, for targeted genes, uh, we will see liquid biopsies replace tissue biopsies uh, within the next 24 months. What to test for, we heard about this yesterday, what to do with the results. There are no clear guidelines, and we know that mutations, different mutations in single genes may have different um, biologic and clinical implications, and how to disseminate this information to practicing clinici busy clinicians will be very important. We heard about non-invasive biomarkers, uh, I, I think will be a major focus in the coming years to capture heterogeneity and for dynamic tumor monitoring. Um, which we've talked about. We will he hear um, results from several ongoing umbrella and basket trials and have a better understanding of the clinical implications of low-frequency mutations. Um, I think we will have identified new targets in biomarkers. So traditionally, we've identified biomarkers going from genotype to phenotype, often retrospective analyses of prospective cohorts, but we're starting to learn the opposite direction, going from phenotype to genotype, extensively molecularly characterizing rare extraordinary responses and, res and extreme resistance phenotypes, guiding preclinical studies and eventually uh, trials. And we're just learning a lot more. This is a recent data from the uh, Stand Up to Cancer PCF Dream Team presented um, this year at GU ASCO, and this is almost 1,000 cases of CRPC, and you can see that there's a long tail of the curve um, which are, represent low-frequency mutations. And while it's important to understand their biologic significance, we will understand uh, in the coming years their clinical significance as we do genotype-phenotype correlations and are really building a, a big precision medicine database to mine these clinical questions, and so I really see this being uh, the tip of the iceberg. 
precision medicine is not just genomics. There are a number of factors that influence why a patient responds or doesn't respond to therapies that we have. Um, and I, I envision multiple levels of molecular analyses incorporated into the clinic uh, in the coming years. I'd like to see functional reports. Uh, what are the pathways that are active in a, in a metastatic tumor that may not be predicted uh, by genomics? I would like to see molecular determinants of immunotherapy response, uh, which will be incredibly important, especially for prostate cancer. So there are a number of biomarker considerations. Uh, just to make the point that understanding the advantages and limitations of technology is becoming increasingly important, not just for researchers, but for practicing clinicians, as technologies are rapidly entering the clinic, uh, and we are, are really the market. I think we will have new biomarker questions, and uh, I think we will be developing rational combination therapies based on science and molecularly based co-targeting strategies. We will have better biomarkers for immunotherapy and epigenetic drugs. We will have better technologies for the early detection of treatment resistance, and with improved assays, less cost, uh, more accessibility, higher throughput, less input, I think we'll be able to ask biomarker questions in different ways and faster. And so while there are a number of challenges that we've uh, talked a lot about, uh, I'm very ex uh, excited or, or um, amazed at how far we've come and excited to see where we will be in two years. Thank you. So thank you, Misha. Is there a question from the audience? To Misha, you have the best expert here to ask. So I asked perhaps the first question. I mean, I think at least in Switzerland, you should always have a genetic counseling before the testing. And we have just a problem that we don't have enough geneticists um, to do all that. I mean, ours is like, you know, booked out for the next uh, six months. So how are you handling that in New York? I think it's a, it's a big problem everywhere um, as we want to scale up and test more patients. Um, I think that, you know, our, eventually our oncology training programs will have more genetic counseling embedded, at least some part of it. Uh, we are often, maybe it's not the right way, but often testing first and offering counseling later, um, and, uh, but trying as much as possible to, to highlight the risks and benefits. Um, but there are, um, I, I know that um, some, some companies even are offering genetic counseling as part of the testing, uh, even send out testing like color genomics. That's exactly what I was going to say, and I have no financial vested interest in color genomics. But for $249, they do a germline screen, and the genetic counseling is done online. So it's a very easy way for a physician to get their patient connected with, a, with germline. The genetic counseling, at least in the United States, is coming like, I mean, the, you know, Heather Chang at the University of Washington has opened her own BRCA clinic now. There's one at UC San Francisco. There's one at the University of Utah just for prostate cancer. So it's really getting big. Thank you. Isn't this an analogy with oligometastatic disease and the new imaging techniques? Because if you start screening everybody, you end up with test result with no demonstration at this point in time that you can alter the care pathway. And we see some private patient coming and saying, you know, I've got metastatic uh, prostate cancer, I've been tested, and I've got a BRCA2 mutation, so my medical oncologist offered to add Olaparib on top. So you, you, you see, it, it, it shouldn't it be restricted? I mean, it's like, it's like modern imaging. I mean, if you're going to do something with it, yes, you can do it. But do, do we have the information to say, yes, it's great, it is great, but do we have the information that, based on this, we can alter the care pathway of the patient? Well, I mean, I think testing has implications for family members, and that's one of the, the main re reasons to test. And then, obviously, therapeutic implications, which we need to have data to suggest at which stage of the disease to give agents like PARP inhibitors or, or platinum. Um, but I think it's really the family implications that, that are, are really motivating people to test widely. Do you agree with that? That I agree with. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. Do you think we should be testing all men with metastatic CRPC or only those with a strong family history? So, 
I mean, I think that it depends on what your threshold would be. If 12% if of patients have, um, have germline alterations, I mean, I think that's high enough to warrant te routine testing. Uh, I think the question will be, is that going to hold up in every uh, country or every disease population? And I think we need more data as to what other additional risk factors there might be to guide. Um, but I am t discussing this with every metastatic patient now. Thank you. A quick question. Why? And which are the barrier changing setting from metastatic to advanced or locally advanced and high risk uh, to conduct the, such study on biomolecular uh, markers? Uh, so, so I, think the bar I guess the question is, is, should we be testing earlier and what are the barriers to Why? testing? I think that setting up um, these, like what we heard yesterday during the amazing session uh, on, on the, the germline alterations, really getting more data about different stages of the disease. Um, there are obvious um, impl huge implications for doing general, general testing, and most patients with local prostate cancer will not have these mutations, and uh, thinking about cost benefit and identifying, you know, really targeting the right population and having dedicated genetics clinics and dedicated programs to better understand this. I don't think we have enough data yet to guide localized disease. 